Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 294 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. Brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's where you can find out more about my book, Be Like the Best, and the Be Like the Best workbook. The book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview is a Be Like, which is an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. Go to continuefit.com to check that out. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com Coaches Corner, Spoke to Coach Boyle about bench pressing with pitchers, actually from a discussion he had on Twitter, and try planer exercise from a discussion we had on the strengthcoach.com forum. For the Train Row data-driven coaching segment, Luke Summers from Power Athlete, he's on again to go deeper about best practices for creating an experience in online training. Speaking of online training, Train Heroic is a human performance company that Coach Bull and I both use to deliver all of our online training. Guys, you'd be blown away by, first of all, their customer service, but also how it allows you to connect with your athletes and your clients. If you're a coach who's not yet coaching on Train Heroic, I don't know what you're waiting for. They just launched plans as low as $10 a month, and they have a free 14-day trial. And if you mention that I sent you, Coach Bull and I are going to put a four-week athlete development program in your account absolutely free. So if you're looking for the best online training solution in the game, go to trainheroic.com to get the 14-day free trial. All right, for the functional movement system segment, Greg Cook is back. He's starting a three-part series on readiness. For the body by boil online.com, hit the gym with a strength code segment. I have on Spencer Tatum. He's the founder and performance director of THP in Scottsdale, Arizona. He also trains the number one golfer in the world, John Rahm. So I spoke to him about what else, how to optimize some golf training, golf performance through training. I also talked to him about his screening process, which is pretty extensive. And he goes into what he calls his Ignite screen, how he uses body comp, and how he uses the FMS to relate to different parts of the swing with golfers. We also talked about creating tension with exercises and delivering an in-person experience on a digital platform. So another Really another way to kind of attack this idea about online training. It's not just uh, with the teams like Luke Summers is going to talk about today, but uh, just with athletes that, you know, you might not see a lot. So, all right, lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out three days just to buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, programs, as well as what we consider the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day having some great conversations. Check that out at shrinkcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I am doing well, Anthony. We are... I think we're getting things figured out, so that's good. And I'm looking forward to September and having a staff meeting and getting, you know, this summer past us. You know, it wasn't great, but we get to move on, which is good. Yeah, I actually, I will be doing my Perform Better lecture in, in two hours. And, and you know, I got to keep reminding them, you know, because you know me, I'm, I'm very, I'm a visual person. I like to move around. I like to use my arms. And doing a Zoom call, you know, Part of me was saying, oh, you know, this sucks. But I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. This is uh, a great opportunity to make an impact on a lot of people. A lot more people are going to be on this than would have come to my my lecture in person. But I'm just an in-person kind of guy. But it's, you know, hey, we'll be back next summer for uh, for the live stuff. So um, I, I can deal with it then. But, yeah, sometimes you got to remind yourself that uh, – you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, we get over it. We'll, we'll get through this. And, uh, um, you know, we're still pretty fortunate. Yeah, and it is it's tough. It's, I mean, but, you know, the one thing I keep trying to remind myself is that everybody's in the same boat, you know, in the fitness field. Everybody's yeah. had, you know, a, a shitty time of it. And, you know, we're not – I mean, I look at 
you know, the Cosgroves are worse off than we are. They get open for a couple of weeks and then get closed down again. At least we've been open. So, but it is, it's getting, uh, uh, you know, it's getting tougher. You can see, I've already, I, I think I mentioned on a previous podcast that I've seen one auction and I just saw another one pop up out here of, you know, a, like a chain place that's going out. And so a lot of times this is going to be about survival. This is going to be about, will you still be here? Can you make it, you know, can you just get your cash flow going? So you're paying your bills. Because yeah. That's, uh, that, that's reality. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, let's move on to some training stuff. You've been, uh, you've had a couple conversations uh, in terms of uh, the, the forum and on Twitter. Uh, let's, let's start out this idea today or uh, yeah, it was today or late yesterday. You posted about pitchers bench pressing. I want you to go over this. I just got a, you know, question or two and, a, and an observation on it. Well, yeah, it's interesting. And I'm trying to sort of to look at things and think, gee, what gains traction? And obviously the, the pitcher bench press thing kind of, um, you know, it definitely sparked some Twitter discussion with some people. So I thought, ah, make a good Instagram video. So, but for those that haven't, you know, they haven't watched it or didn't read the Twitter thread, it was just the, the question, and I don't know where it actually originated from, but it was do, you know, do you bench press with pitchers? And um, you mean barbell? Let's just start that barbell bench press. Barbell bench press, yes, a barbell bench press versus, let's say, a dumbbell bench press. So I think, yes, that that's uh, to be clear. And one of the things that I said was in the two years that I was in Major League Baseball, we did not have one pitcher. We didn't have one athlete actually bench press with a barbell. I don't think I saw anyone do a barbell bench press. And obviously we didn't program it, but no one came in and said, hey, I'm a big bench press guy. I want to do this. And our elite, like at that time, we had a very elite pitching staff in terms of, you know, when I got there, we had, John Lackett, uh, John Lester, Josh Beckett, John Lackey, you know, Rich Hill, um, Andrew Miller. You know, we had, we had some real studs, some guys that were all-star level guys. And not one of those guys wanted to bench press. And it's another topic. Uh, the only one, Lester was the only one who wanted to do a chin-up. No one else would, you know, want to do chin-ups. And they tend, pitchers in general tend to be larger guys, at least at the major league level, with really long levers and not great strength to body weight ratios. But you know, when you look at those types of guys, they can be extremely successful. I think it was the Mets that had a guy uh, that was uh, they were showing on Twitter the other day that's like 6'5", 165, and a um, you know, young kid that's coming up. And you, know, you look at a guy like Sale, who from what people have said, I don't, I'd never worked with Sale, but he, you know, he's 6'6", six, six or 6'7", six, 185 pounds, supposedly, and not a guy that lifts weights. And I guess that the short run of it is that it just it pisses off the, you know, I think it pisses off like the kind of meatheads, you know, the guys who, you know, what's wrong with bench press? And my thing is there's nothing wrong with bench press, and that's what I said. I teach every kid that comes in our facility to barbell bench press because I think it's easier, and I said this in my training kids talk, it's easier from a coordination standpoint. It's much more difficult to have, you know, dumbbells and right and left and trying to control right and left than it is to try to control one fixed bar. And we've seen that repeatedly with our young athletes. And, but the flip side is, I don't think we have had any kids, you know, college level or beyond who will bench press with a barbell. So that was sort of the... Yeah. <clears throat> I really, what I liked what you said about... You saw so many different styles of dumbbell bench pressing and you didn't make any corrections. So like there was different elbow positions. And I really thought that was a tell on the art of coaching because a young strength coach would never do that. A young coach, no, your elbow should be, you know, let's say 90 degrees or 45 degrees or they would just stay on this one thing. I just want you to talk a little bit about, it. you know, you saw all these different styles. You really just didn't feel like, why didn't you feel like that they needed to be corrected? Because you know what I felt like, particularly with major league pitchers, I think no one knows their shoulder better than a major league pitcher knows his own shoulder. Yeah. Knows what feels good, knows. Because, I mean, they are so, and I've said this before, it's like 
Rain Man. You know what I mean? It's like this intuitive art that is very, very difficult to teach. And there's a really small, small subset of people that can actually do it. And they know like when they can throw, when they can't, how hard they can throw, how fast they can throw. They can be very, very definitive about the status of their shoulders. So I looked at it and thought, hey, if I get a guy, you know, like some of the guys um, were almost, you know, it would almost look like a floor press in terms of it was about a half a range of motion. They weren't going all the way down. But I was like, you know something? This guy's pitching at the all-star level, at the major league level, and that's what he finds comfortable. Who am I to be like, oh, you're doing, you know, I love that. Like, and I, I think I said this in another thread, but, you know, the, you're doing it wrong. And you're kind of <laughs> like, um, I don't, you know, is it wrong? You know, if you've got a guy who's pitching at the major league level and who's an all-star and you're like, oh, that's wrong. You kind of look... I always used to look at it, and I used to have this, my sister-in-law, Karen, used to work with me sometimes, and we'd do an exercise, and she'd look at me, and she'd go, the, the guys are doing it wrong. And I'd be like, well, they're definitely doing it different. I said, let's watch, out for, let's watch them for a while and see if we really think it's wrong. And I'll give you another example. You know, like a rotational row, like it's a big exos kind of, you know, yeah. Mark Verstegen, to yeah. me, kind of invented rotational row, right? <clears throat> but their version of rotational row was very much like a, a wide, almost a squat kind of stance and very sort of change of direction oriented, you know. Um, when our hockey guys did it, they put their feet really close together and they looked like they were going around a corner. <laughs> and, uh-huh. and Carol's like, that, that's not right. And I was like, I don't know that that's not right as much as it's different than what we had actually intended them to do. And after a while, I just let them all do it that way. Because, you know, what they want it to be, if you think about, like, let's just say whatever, baseball, tennis, whatever it is, you know, wide base, kind of that Michael Jordan knees inside of feet sort of valgusy thing that everybody says is wrong, but that good athletes do. And and our hockey guys were totally opposite. They were like inside edge, outside edge, leaning, using their body weight, like they were going around a corner. And you're kind of like, okay, they're almost like they're two different exercises. But here's how these guys decided to figure out how to do it. So I guess you're right. It's, it's a good pickup by you, and it's really a big art of coaching thing because when you look at this stuff, you, it, particularly with elite-level performance, I always say they got there without you. <laughs> when I showed up at the Red Sox, you know, Josh Beckett had been, you know, whatever, you know, Kid Heat, you know, cover of Sports Illustrated, you know, first-round draft pick, you know, won a championship with the Marlins. I don't, you know, he could look at me and be like, and he would sometimes. I love Josh. Josh is one of the funniest guys in baseball. But he had no problem telling you what he thought. And he'd look at you and be like, hey, Mike, just so you know, I was a millionaire and an all-star before you got here. You know, and you're like, <laughs> you know, you're absolutely right. You were a millionaire and an all-star before I showed up. So I need to be trusted advisor as opposed to dictator. And I think that's the biggest difference, <laughs> excuse me, when you move towards the elite level is realizing that that's your job. My job now becomes, hey, I'm a trusted advisor for this guy. I'm helping this guy to prolong his career or I'm helping him to improve his performance. I'm not the dictator that I was in a college setting where I could just tell everybody what they were going to do. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, it's a big art of coaching point that I think people miss when they're making that transition. The, the biggest thing... I, whenever I hear anybody, you know, they're going to the pros and they talk about, you know, you know, they got to lay down the law. I'm like, oh, you're gonna... <laughs> because you, you, you can't go into a pro setting. You could pro football. You can because they've got non-guaranteed contracts and you can, you know, guys can be cut if they don't do what they're supposed to do. But in all the other pro sports, you're not going to be, you're not going to be laying down the law. Yeah. Um, you, you're going to be laying down the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> that's good now, you know interesting side note before I get to my next question Josh Beckett won the series in New York for the Marlins I was in the bar business at that point they came they celebrated their win at my bar upstairs in the private room and uh, it was a pretty crazy night and uh, he was one of the first ones there I always remember that he said something the guy who was with him said something like this guy just won the World Series MVP blah 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 I was like listen First of all, you're in New York, so settle down. 
I don't know who he is. If he was on the Bruins or, you know, the Panthers, I would know him. <laughs> so let's not get too crazy. Go ahead. You're, you're in. But anyway, um, Coach, so um, I wanted to also talk to you about this idea about Triplanar. That's another one that kind of came back up. And you had sent me an article you might repost with some edits, up, you know, to update it. But talk to us about this, you know, multiplanar training. It's coming, like, it seems to be, you said it's coming back. Uh, again, talk to us your feelings on this. Yeah, that this could be a whole hour because I have really strong feelings about this. It's very interesting because I felt like, and that was what I tried. I got. I have to refine that article a little bit more, and I appreciate you reading it for me. But um, I think there was a time when the idea of functional training, when I first heard like the Vern Gambettas and the Gary Grays and those guys talk about functional training and it makes more sense to be on one leg, and talking about the idea of, you know, muscles working eccentrically and concentrically, blah, blah, blah. It all made so much sense. And then there was a time when, you know, probably a decade later when the triplanar thing kind of went off the rails because all of a sudden everything was about, you know, moving in three planes and getting into the transverse plane. And, and it was kind of like, you know, in the weight room, transverse plane's an iffy place in the weight room. And this is what yeah. happens. Like, so a lot of the, the multi-planar, you know, sort of the Gary Gray type stuff. And, and by extension, say, say some of the stuff Todd Wright does really well is not very easy to do well in the weight room. You've got to really think that stuff through. And that's why I gave the example of, um, on my Instagram, of something like a half meal chop and realizing that you want the rotation to be more in the thoracic spine. You, I think what happened is we just got into this like random, if it was three planes, it was good. You know, rotate as much as you can, reach as much as you can, bend as much as you can, side bend, rotate. And and that's not good for the body. The body, and I've said this over and over again, the body does what's easiest, not what's best. And so it's really easy to hurt yourself when you move beyond the guidelines of what I would consider to be good exercise. And again, it's what I consider to be good exercise. Other people may have other considerations, but it just was interesting that this popped back up with uh Tara and she's been great god I love it because you know I I sort of critique things and talked and she was very good on the forum about posting what she was thinking you know some people would have gotten defensive so it was really good to sort of have that interaction started by somebody who wasn't going to get all sensitive she's and, really uh, yeah she's she's one of those people who, you, who really brings so much to the forum because of that Yes, and I think that willingness to – the biggest thing is the willingness to ask what might be perceived as a dumb question. Yeah. Because they're generally – you go back to the idea, there are no dumb questions. And you go back, it actually prompted me. It was really funny. I have a slide that I put into my uh, – my first staff meeting is going to be in basically two weeks or a week and a half now. But, um, you know, because I talked to you about the idea about, you know, you want to peek in the rabbit hole but you don't necessarily want to dive in the rabbit hole. And I found a great picture of um, Alice, of Alice in Wonderland, like just her, her legs, like her back end sticking out of the rabbit hole. When she <laughs> nice. <dove in. laughs> you know, but it's like, it's that, you know, you want to, it's like, you know, okay, PRI, you want to be interested in PRI. Absolutely. You want to understand, you want to listen to the Michael Mullins of the world. And, and you want to understand this multi planar training approach. You want to understand whatever isometrics, triphasic, whatever it is. But if you're abandoning what you're doing from a programming standpoint for a totally different style of programming, that's not good. That is not a, that's yeah. a, an indication that you didn't have a really good program to begin with. If you look at it like for us and say, hey, you know, the PRI stuff makes me realize that we can do some, some asymmetrical work and that we should be more conscious of our breathing – then we, I learned something from my time with Michael Mullen, which I did. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've listened to Michael talk a bunch of times, and I love listening to him talk. But I'm, I've seen other people who suddenly, and I, I won't um, give specific examples because, again, it, it, it's probably perceived as being negative. But there are other coaches where suddenly half the workout was like laying there, you know, 90-90 breathing and straw breathing and blowing up balloons. And it's like, no, you shouldn't be, you know, when we think about, you know, we're going to run, jump, sprint, throw, lift. Like, 
we should still be running, jumping, sprinting, throwing, lifting, all that stuff. None of that should change. Or I shouldn't say none of it should change. It may change subtly based on what you learn from some of these experiences, but it shouldn't suddenly be, you know, we go back to the kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater thing in terms of uh, suddenly abandoning what you're doing. Yeah, from a programming standpoint, in favor of something else. I, I, you know, I attended Todd Wright's mentorship and came back. Really, you know, you would have liked the, what I added in terms of okay, I didn't abandon anything. I just extended a piece of my warm up with the, you know, the rotation. I mean, the uh, the, the the split sp- squat matrices with you know the reaches as well and the lunge matrix i just thought it made a lot of sense especially for my population my lens 50 to 85 and where people you know as they get older they got to worry about falling and i felt like these uh lunge matrix really prepare people to be able to handle these different possibilities in in life and in their sport but uh, I agree with you on on you know going too deep down the rabbit hole. But one question I and I asked you this and I edited your not edited your article. I I sent you some suggestions and some questions. Have you read any of you know or or like ex- studied any of the latest stuff? I know you did a long time ago, but people like Michelle or Dalcor or or Todd Wright or I don't know if Todd's done anything lately because he's in the NBA, but. Um, but some of this triplanar stuff with people that have had some time to really kind of weed out some of the things and have some practical experience with it. I haven't since, and I'm trying to think, it was probably, a, a, I would say it might have been maybe 2015, I went I went to the Gary Gray course. Oh, okay. I said, okay, I need, I was like, I need to understand this better. And I left, I was so aggravated. And I felt bad because I Gary was great to me. I mean, back in like the Cam Neely days, like Gary Gray changed my life, to be honest, changed my thought process. But as he moved along the continuum, you know, I felt like, you know, again, he went too far down his own rabbit hole to the point, like I was asking him questions and he wouldn't answer them. You know, I was asking him about things like relative flexibility and, you know, about lumbar spine range of motion and things. And he just wouldn't answer the question. He'd be like, yeah, we're going to get to that. You know, we'll get to that a little bit later. And I sat there. I went actually with Karen, with my sister-in-law, and we sat there the whole time, and he never got to it. He never addressed. Because my thing was, okay, these are legitimate concerns of other therapists about some of these things. And I just would like to have somebody, okay, this is, you know, you, this is how you feel. This is how this person feels. Can you explain to me why, you know, where is the disconnect? And, and why would there be a disconnect? Because... A lot of times, especially as strength and conditioning coaches, we're a little bit at the mercy of, you know, the physical therapist to some degree, because they really tend to be the big drivers. If you look at, say, in the last, you know, 20 years, you know, it's been whatever, you know, Gary Gray, PRI, you know, some of these things, it hasn't been, you know, strength and conditioning, if anything, has probably stayed like blinders on, myopic squat, bench, deadlift, you know, get strong, two legs, you know what I mean? And yeah. the people that are challenging us tend to be people from a little bit outside our field in the rehab world. And I think that's a really good thing. But I also think that people need to be able to address your concern. Like, okay, here's my concern. <clears throat> what do you feel? You know, can you explain to me in kind of layman's terms why this might be, you know, different? Yep, absolutely. And I always said, Todd, like, I love to watch Todd because Todd does a really good job of taking that concept because he's gone deep into Gary's stuff and then bringing it back and making it, you know, like when you think, you know, there's so much like, okay, you know, whatever, frontal plane stuff. Okay, you know, I, I believe we, we do need to do a better job getting into the frontal plane. I think we need to control the transverse plane to me is one of control because, you know, everybody's got the motion. But I think a lot of people don't have control of the motion. So I think we need to learn to control the transverse plane. But at the same time, you know, we got to throw med balls. We've got to be able to work, you know, explosive hip rotation, explosive trunk rotation. But when we start to visit that with heavier objects, 
or when we start to think of the extreme of the range, like do we want to increase that range? That was always one of my big things was I don't think we're, I don't think that range is something that we want to increase. And I, I always go back to, to the idea, you know, the spine is designed in a certain way for a certain reason. It's evolution. And to try to create more range of motion in something that is deliberately constrained probably doesn't really make sense. So I think, you know, that's where people, and you know, you get, you get mixed in with, you know, with yoga, there's, there's just a lot of stuff that gets kind of jumbled into this cocktail sometimes and doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily fit, at least not in my mind. Agreed. And then like you always say, I mean, there's that pendulum swing and people take things so far, like you talked, just talked about the rabbit hole. So that's really part of the problem instead of like looking at intelligently and saying, where, how can I fit this into my system or what's going on? Uh, but, um, yeah, the conversation continues. Good, good stuff, Coach. Uh, so thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll speak to you next time. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, right now at Perform Better, remember, even though we're exercising social distancing and we can't go to, for the most part, seminars in person, it doesn't mean we have to stop learning. Perform Better is excited to keep hosting the free summer seminar series. I just did mine the other day. And it's for everybody since it's free. Live presentations and Q&A sessions via Zoom. So you get like an hour and 15 minute session. And then afterwards, it's time for Q&A with the presenter. Uh, in total, it was 67 fitness professionals. And it's going until mid-September. So guys, check that out at performbetter.com. All right, now it's time for the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, and I'm continuing uh, my little talk with here with Luke Summers, who's the COO of Power Athlete. We had last episode, we talked about just uh, what are some best practices getting into this idea about online training and, and creating programs as an additional revenue stream. Um, and there's some different ways to do it on Train Heroic. You can you can work one-on-one -on -one with somebody You can and give them accountability. You can do whatever you want in terms of, uh, there's a lot of in-app communication that, that Train Heroic has done a great job with. Or you can do some standalone programs. Let's say it's a 12-week uh, ice hockey program. Or you can do the team training. And, and so uh, Luke and the team over at Power Athlete have done, uh, really that's where they, they sit a lot in the team training, which is the month. But actually, I'll let Luke, th first of all, thanks for doing this again. You got it, Ant. Hey, it's been too long, buddy. <laughs> exactly. And um, so let, just give people an idea about what is team training. So team training is essentially a a month to month subscription. I'll, I'll say from the clients or the athletes or the subscribers perspective. It's, it's daily training that's pushed to your smartphone. Uh, you hop in with a group of people, follow the training uh, ongoing from month to month. And then from, uh, from the strength coaches side of things, you're working on potentially like this interesting, undulating and congruent multi-year template for your longtime subscribers, but also training that has to be ready to accept anyone at any time. So it, it does skirt some of the proverbial best practices that you might see in like a nice quad or macro cycle or micro cycle because man, you know, we're working with some teams on train heroic that have five, six, 700 people following the same training across the, across the globe with different levels of experience. And even the challenge becomes different equipment. So, uh, the training needs to be structured in such a way, uh, where there's, instruction on what to do if you don't have equipment, instruction on what to do if you're new here, and especially if you're referencing prior performance, which we do frequently, right? Like, hey, you know, you hit a heavy triple uh, two weeks ago. We need to reference that for this training today. Oh, you didn't hit that triple? Here's what you need to do. So you need to think through those scenarios to, to make it a frictionless onboarding process because the biggest thing we've seen is the people who use the training, who are logging the programming, will stay the longest. And when people get frustrated if they don't have equipment or maybe they don't know how to do a movement or they don't have time to complete the whole session and there's not instruction on how to mitigate these things, um, they're going to flip out and they're going to be out of there. So, so this, um, this has been the bread and butter for us. And what's been a paradigm shift for us is we've had to, had to step a little bit outside of modeling the gym business. And we've taken on 
and research some other paragons in more like the software as a service type of industry. And this is like software and tech space. And there's a lot to be learned from there with how they help create an experience and drive usership and ultimately uh, drive that monthly recurring revenue. Very cool. So when somebody comes on, so let's say I sign on to the team, mm -hmm. um, how much, uh, like I, like you said, I mean, there might be people that have been on there for two or three years. And, right. you know, your challenge as a coach is to try to make sure that that new person can kind of step right in pretty pretty seamlessly. How do you do right. that? Do you do that in, in the coach's notes through videos? How are you doing that? So we did it with a, we do it now with a, um, an onboarding email and it used to be Anthony it was funny cause it used to be a ton of Q and a and everything you need to know. And what we found out is people just needed permission to start today. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's it. Don't go back to day one. Don't do this. Don't do that. It, it, we just put the, the parent it's paramount. You start today and log your results and just get them going. And if you need anything, uh, ask us on the feed. So leveraging the tools in app so that it becomes part of their routine uh, to have that to have that device next to them, get them logging, and then from there it, it almost takes care of itself. Within Train Heroic, we can we can use some analytics to check reporting. Uh, we could ask them to post their results or um, you know in the program narratives. If you were to program a bench press, uh, you could say, hey. Uh, tell me what weight you used in the feed. And then that way the community gets to see everything as well. And it starts to build up that community space because people are going to come for the programming. They're going to stay for the community. And that's a principle that I think we've learned in the micro gym space. You know, people will come thinking they just want to lose weight, but they end up making friends with coaches and developing mentorships um, with coaches and other clients and athletes and things like that. So you, you do want to leverage those principles as well in getting in setting the expectations of how to use the training. Absolutely. I love that. And like you said, I just want to mention that in-app feed because well, this, the dirty secret here is in the beginning, everybody, this is going to be really hard and you're going to have to put that extra work in. But Luke, you were saying to me earlier that really what happens is the community ends up, answering a lot of the questions that the new people That's have right. and they take them on board. Very cool. Mm -hmm. That's if you set it up right, you can uh, put that work in and uh, you can you can have it rolling. So five to 700 people, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Luke, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, everybody, check out Power Athlete HQ. Uh, all their programs are on there. Be worth it if you're interested in doing uh, signing up to Train Rock. Remember, they got the free 14-day trial. We'll put a program in there, uh, Coach Boyle and I will. And it uh, might be worth it to you know, take a couple months with these guys, see how they're doing it. Like I said uh, last episode, when I told Josh – that I was, you know, look, I want to get into the marketplace. He said, go to Power Athlete HQ. These guys are, are killing it, and they're doing it right, and they're doing it with integrity. So, Luke, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. Hi, this is Greg Cook, and uh, welcome to the Functional Movement Systems segment. I uh, want to talk a few minutes uh, in a first of a three-part series about state of readiness. Now, most of the great strength coaches I've worked with really get this at the professional level and military operations get this at the highest level. State of readiness means almost more in the moment where we've got to do action than anything else you did in the past and any future outcome you might hope would happen. Your current state of readiness says a lot about how it's gonna to go today. And the more I know about you, the more I know your range of performance within the state of readiness. Now, I know that some people who have a large group of athletes trying to find out what the weekend was like, uh, simply weigh them. Fluctuations in weight definitely can tell you a lot about state of readiness, probably more about hydration and inflammation than anything else. But when we all got locked down and we all sort of had to change our routines a little bit, I really wanted to think personally about my own state of readiness. Before I pontificate on this uh, later on about what we can do professionally to leverage that current state of readiness, we got to ask ourselves, what are we applying in our own life? And one of the things that, that came to my attention was a, a large study done with people who were sleep deprived and, and dehydrated uh, doing functional movement and, and looking at movement patterns and specifically balance uh, tested as well. And the funny thing is, 
as you can imagine, with what you guys know about state of readiness, when you're sleep deprived and dehydrated, uh, number one, you're not processing well. And that processing is done in an environment that is electrically <laughs> desensitized because all electrical processes in the body require adequate hydration. So we not only have bad processing, we got bad cabling if you've got both those situations. Yet for the people who scored low on the FMS or the Y balance test in that situation, how many were getting ready to get a corrective assigned to them or a stretch or a stability drill assigned to them when really their state of readiness was influencing many of their scores? Because as we can imagine, get that sleep uh, behavior stabilized over a few days, get that hydration stabilized over a few days. Um, and ask yourself this, what's going to happen to heart rate variability? What's going to happen to the balance that you have between your parasympathetic, uh, your, your rest and digest system and your sympathetic, your fight or flight system. And you're not really supposed to be stuck immovably in one situation or the other. You're supposed to be able to dance back and forth across that line and respond to the situations that are present. Well, if we think about a training session, a coaching session or a competitive session, the better balance you go into that situation with, the more you can upregulate or downregulate yourself. I brought this back around to me personally and you know, every now and then I try to listen to what I say, being an ambassador of the functional movement screen, the selective functional movement assessment, and many of the other functional tools that we use. But I often realize that we also lose strategy by going after a tactic. We all have those certain measures that we lean on. And many times we try to make a single particular measurement more important than the other. And what I realized in my life was if I'm focusing too much on the movement end of my own personal development and not enough on the rest and regen, well, when we start talking rest and regen, we just go to the, well, how many hours sleep do I need? Well, quality's got a lot to do with that. Well, what's my heart rate supposed to be? What well, blah, blah, blah. And we know that if your heart rate variability is sort of jacked up, you're doing something wrong in your lifestyle. And let's be honest, you can probably already predict which one of your lifestyle behaviors is least appropriate. You may have dietary fluctuations. You may not be good at managing your hydration, and you may be underserving your sleep needs. Start attacking those things and watching something like heart rate variability. That used to be a very expensive thing to watch, but watch it on yourself before you start imposing it on other people and see if you can influence your state of readiness without adding a movement metric. See if you can do something in your lifestyle that is going to actually help you have a better state of readiness so you can then use that personal experience and some degree of confidence when you're coaching and training others. I can always tell when a coach has read an article and digested information as opposed to a coach that's actually had experience and good thoughtful reflection against a group of peers equally as experienced. That's a whole different thing. But in the very first part of the conversation, a lot of things sound alike for people who've digested a lot of information compared to people who've had a lot of experience. But as you press, as you ask questions, you will find that one person did consume a lot of information, but they honestly don't know how they feel about that. And so if you press them a little bit, you wind up with some emotional responses where if you press somebody who's got confidence in the situation, it's not cockiness. They know which way to go based on what they're going to do. So what I want to tell you is before we start going into this state of readiness with other people, reapply it to ourselves and realize that a lot of the best movement advice you can give somebody is going to be lifestyle advice. This is Greg Cook, and uh, this is part one of three, state of readiness for functional movement systems. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle online.com. Hit the gym with the strength coach segment. Remember, become an insider to Mike Boyle's strength and conditioning with staff meetings in service and complete access to the MBSC programs. Guys, check that out at bodybyboyleonline.com. All right, today I got on Spencer Tatum. He's the founder and performance director of THP in Scottsdale, AZ. 
That's Arizona for you kids that don't know your abbreviations. His unique approach to fitness, performance training, and coaching stems from his experience as an elite college athlete, played some football in college, and had some injuries. And um, what's kind of cool was he learned a lot through that experience, and uh, it inspired him to really get his exercise physiology degree at Ohio University and and kind of continue to learn and it went through you know different disciplines and different certifications um, and he's developed a unique niche in the sports world especially in golf he works with uh, he's been named one of the top 50 best golf fitness professionals by golf D- digest and um won a national championship with the asu golf team also trains john rom who's basically not basically he is the number one golfer in the world so uh you know you got to be careful with uh with those guys <laughs> so spencer thanks for doing this what's up anthony how you doing all Good right to be on and uh glad to be a part of the show i mean big fan all right, excited. You know, obviously we're going to start with the golf stuff and, you know, my background with the golf as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always great. Like, you know, there's a certain brotherhood, I think, in golf fitness training for the for the trainers that aren't, you know, taking weights and acting like it's a golf club um, who understand <laughs> like the, the, the struggle that we've had over the, you know, the last, uh, you know, really 15 years since, since TPI started, uh, you know, the, the really the certification, the first world golf fitness summit, but the ups and downs through that and getting golf pros, uh, really, really bought in, not just the guys on the tour, but really probably more importantly, the club pros, but let's talk about that. Uh, you know, John won the Memorial, uh, a couple months ago, he's the number one golfer in the world. I think that week, you guys had posted him, you know, training some heavy trap bar deadlifts, and it just mm-hmm. there's been a lot of criticism with guys, guys getting bigger. Bryson DeChambeau has gotten really big. You know, we know what Tiger's gone through and what what Rory's gone through, and Rory faced a lot of criticism uh, through the Golf Channel, really. Um, mostly, and a lot of people still don't believe in it. So talk to us about what you see out there, some of the myths that you feel like are out there and things that you're doing with John that you feel like a lot of people might not expect. Yeah, I think a lot of things in the golf world is you think you need to do these golf-specific exercises and this correctional program. And there are times and places for certain things, but I think at the end of the day, they're still an athlete. And we need to train them like an athlete and, and think about what do they need because – when you look at the full spectrum of everything they have to do, I mean, they have to translate from right to left leg or left to right leg, right? They have to swing an object over 100 miles an hour. I mean, there's a lot of demands of forces and torque, and so they have to be resilient and sustainable and then continue to adapt to every situation because, as you know, and no course is the same and no variables are the same, and so they hit the best athlete wins. So doing those things and putting things in the right place is the most important thing. Yeah, it's it's funny. I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I think a lot of people just think it's a lot of like correctives. And I think we see that in some of these, you know, whatever golf fitness programs that you see ads mm-hmm. for or whatever. And they're just sitting there and all you see them doing is like using a golf club or just using a towel and they're stretching and 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 really that gets communicated to to the end user. You know what I mean? Yeah. But sometimes the correction was the training. Right. I mean, we've heard, you know, Charlie Weingroff, a good friend of ours, you know, talk about it for years that the, the, the training and rehab should be the same. And so, I mean, using a heavy load sometimes does open up the mobility. Like, you, you know, we need tension to create movement. Right. We have to have a stable surface for things to move on. So, but with like <clears throat> talking about like the, the heavy deadlifts and stuff like that, like that was a process. Right. That's been a process. If, if you ever go back and look at, some of John's original screens. I mean, he couldn't even squat when he first came over and he has a lot of limitations. I mean, one being a club put on one leg. So working around those challenges and building a program to support him so he can express his abilities, which as we know are are pretty good. So um, really understanding and using screens and methodologies to assess and not guess what will lead, led us to that, to where we're having high performance. Absolutely. And, and, you know, what's interesting, uh, you had a great article on Functional Movement Systems website on functionalmovement.com. And so I want to kind of go over some of that to talk about, you know, just really optimizing golf performance through training and and uh, really go over uh, your 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 screening process, not 
Just because you talk about the Ignite screen, I want you to go over that. You do some body mm -hmm. comp, and we'll, we'll talk about that after Ignite. Then you get into mm -hmm. FMS, and and I want to I want people I want to go over some things with the FMS as well because I want people to understand the relationship with some of these uh, these these screens to golf. So talk to us though first about what's the Ignite screen. Well, the night screen is more, we got to look deeper, right? If we're going to really build resiliency and we're going to understand what's going to be the right spot for that person to start and to get into where they want to go, we need to look deeper than just movement, strength, power, speed, endurance. We need to look at and really understand the individual. So in the night screen, we're looking at a couple of things. We're looking at their medical history. We're looking at any injuries, any their developmental age, what sports they played when they were younger. Uh, what's their training age? What's their past training? What barriers have they faced? Have they hired a trainer before? What's their communication style and their motivation style um, that works for them? And then also to collecting some some things that we can use the rewards down the road when they hit certain mile markers. So we already have that information coming in, so we can always surprise our members or our clients with that. So that night screen is is important for us because that's a great starting point to give us some unique insights before we even go into the FMS or the TPI. So we kind of have a checklist going on in our head of kind of, okay, here's some things that may happen or here's where the challenges may lie. Very, very cool. Like you, so, so what you're saying basically too, is with your ignite screen, you're also, you're getting all this personal information, almost like that kind of has to keep, you know, it, this is a good, a good thing for people to know. It's like your mind it reminds me of uh, the the CRM uh, software where people mm -hmm. kind of uh, it's customer retention management. Right. And and so basically you you kind of keep compiling what's Spencer's kids names, what's his wife's name, what's his his cousin, what's what's his favorite flavor or whatever. And like you talked about, you start to build and and really understand about that person so uh gives us an example of like something that you were talking about like that's how you reward people how, how have you done that you know some people you know some people need uh external motivation so i mean you know they hit a certain match they hit a certain pr right you know they're motivated by you know, say their favorite restaurant in town is a true food restaurant here so you know getting my gift card for that um, just something to keep them inspired and keep them going and keep them like, okay, I'm making progress, getting recognized. Some people want to be recognized socially. So in our facility, we have on our, our software platform, it pops like every time somebody does a PR, um, it automatically shows up on the screen. We have automations built. We show how many PRs. I think yesterday we had over 70 PRs across the globe um, that happened. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's cool to see. And they, that really motivates people because we really try to create the social norm to keep people going. And, and so I think that's like a big thing because we know, I mean, man, you know, I've been around great coaches and great teams that culture wins championships. So having those things already in place, um, then the member or the client or the athlete feels like, wow, these guys really get me. They really understand who I am and what makes me tick because at the end of the day, the mind is way more powerful than the body, you know? Absolutely. And I, I'll remind people as well, when you get this information in the very beginning, People and you give them a gift card to that restaurant, they're gonna be like, How the hell did he remember that? Meanwhile, you took it from it was like one of the first things that you you took in your questionnaire, but uh you have all that information, but nobody remembers any of that stuff that you did that. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of this, right? Is that the information is so powerful these days that we have it there and if we can access it, wow, the decisions we can make like so we're not we're not wasting time on like hey what do you think they would like or what do you think we should do for our members or what do you think we should do for our clients how can we get them going right how we get them the next level like sometimes that those little things make the biggest difference whether it's member retention or it is in in getting towards goals and i think also what we also really like to do is we know their sport background with sports they play developmentally um that can also help our communication with the client um you know, we've had people who have been swimmers that now play golf. And so be able to talk to them, okay, remember when you were doing this in swimming? Okay, this is very similar to that. And they can connect the dots a lot better. So having those insights and, and knowing your, your clients and your athletes, like, just could be a game changer to make the training come to life. Yeah, very cool. Well, in the next part of that article you were talking about after Ignite Screen, it was the body comp screen. And again, remember that guys, this is a, this is for a golf, a golf article. Uh, and so a lot of people, you don't hear a lot of people talking about the body comp screen for their golfers so much right away. Uh, but you said you use it to understand how they manage stress. Can you expand on that? 
Yeah, I mean, we know that higher body composition has a lot of correlation into stress management, high cortisol levels. So being able to understand that and see, okay, are we at an acceptable level? We don't be optimal, but are we at an acceptable level of body composition for health, right? Because if somebody's not healthy, like it doesn't really matter what's going to happen, the movement is not going to happen with the strength and the power because it, health has to be our prim primary focus to start. Now we're looking at that also too, we're looking at on the, we use the in-body. So on the in-body, we can look at, you know, their, their percent body fat. We can look at how much skeletal muscle tissue they have. We can also look at how much body composition. So we can also see over time from a training load perspective is that if we're putting on too much load and their body comps going up when we, we should be going down, we may need to stop back and say, okay, are we over training or are we under fueling or are we under recovering? And so it helps us drive decisions, and it's also going to help us to ask better questions, you know, about sleep and stress and all these other things that we're now looking at because we know how important these variables are into elite performance and human performance. Yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's an overlooked piece in terms of, you know, you're doing all these other things, and if they're not working, you sometimes, you know, you can't tell or, you, you know, specifically you can't tell. You, when you get those, those numbers, though, you can tell. Mm -hmm. You can be like, hey – it, something's wrong here. Let's go back and figure this out. We got you on this nutrition plan. You're we got you. We got a great workout. You're following. You're complying. But what's going wrong? Maybe it's sleep. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. So very cool. I love that. Um, haven't really heard a lot of people talking about that. Uh, well, Spent. Go ahead. Look. Sorry. Go ahead. I also I also think too. Like you know, we're talking about Bryson DeChambeau and and John and and different guys like that that are now like driving the hell of the ball. Right. So we have to understand, look at look at a golfer and they're coming in, they're like six foot and they're 165 pounds. And they're wondering why they're not hitting it far. Well, we know we need mass times acceleration to hit the ball far. So if we get great acceleration, but we don't have enough mass. then that could be limiting our driving distance and our, and our rotational power. So having that on the other side of the coin also really helps, too. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great point. Um, let's talk about some of the screens because everybody here on the show, for the most part, Obviously, FMS has been on the show from day one, um, and you kind of related some of, or not some of, all the screens to the golf swing. So let's let's talk about, you know, let's go over each screen, really, uh, and just, you know, give us an overview of how it's related to, or, you know, and why it's important for you to use this um, with golfers, the deep squat. Yeah, I think the deep squat, I mean, it, it's a great fundamental exercise. And as we know, it's the highest order of the FMS. And we want to make sure we have the ability to load into our hips and be able to separate our upper body and lower body in a sagittal plane. So having that, I mean, that's key for us to have vertical thrust in our golf swing to create rotational power. Um, it also gives us great insights to how the whole body or the organism is working together in a high pattern. And it guides us in our program design. So deep squat is, is totally relevant, um, but it's the last thing we're looking at improving as we go through the FMS. Yeah, yeah, of course. Hurdle step, I think people forget how important something like the hurdle step can be, especially with the single leg stability uh, idea. Expand on uh, why the hurdle step is important, what you're looking at. Yeah, the hurdle step, I mean, we're looking at the ability to do the candy crit acceleration. I mean, this is hugely important for golfers who have a sway and slide issue. Very similar to the TPI single leg stance uh, screen that, that we do in TPI. But the FMS gives us, like, now we're getting a little bit more dynamic with it and gives us a little bit more insight. It's like, okay, can we, can we lock down the foot? Can we lock down the hip? Can we separate one leg from the other leg and, and create acceleration? Because we need to be able to accelerate in multiple facets in the golf swing. And so this screen really gives them great insights to a very simple thing that hurts a lot of people swing and slide. Yeah. The sway. Actually, yeah, you're right. Both of them are, are huge. And, uh, but I see so much with that sway because, uh, people just trying to create something on the, on the backswing that they don't have. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. we've seen that. Yeah. It's a fun one to watch. Yeah. Uh, inline lunge you talk, and this is really interesting. And I think, you know, for the average person, they don't always understand the word, you know, they get nervous, in golf with the word deceleration, uh, we all know how, like when we talk about deceleration, we understand it's this transfer, but talk to us about how the, uh, the inline lunge helps you decide or looks at the ability to decelerate. 
Yeah, I mean, the inline lunge is a great, great screen because we can really look at, okay, we're coming back in our takeaway. You know, are we going to be efficient at going from in the down, in the backswing to the downswing? And then can we reaccelerate the club? And as we're reaccelerating the club, can we post on that, that lead leg to really create that whipping motion so we can create max club head speed? So the inline lunge gives us a great insight as to the candidate accelerate is this something that we need to look at because we know that we can only accelerate as much as we can deaccelerate. So we get all gas, no brakes. It's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, active straight leg raise. Talk to us about that. Well, I think active straight leg raise, I mean, it's this the, the one we'd always look at first. And the active straight leg raise is do we have hip mobility, right? Can we, can we lock the midline down? Can we separate one leg from the other leg? And it gives us great insights to their hip mobility and why they may be having this early extension issue or why they can't load into one hip or the other hip. So having that great active straight leg raise, it's vital um, for an effective and efficient golf swing. Yeah, the hips, I mean, you know, it, they're so important. Uh, you know, golfers understand it to a, to a certain extent, but um, it's something that as trainers, we really need to make sure we're focused. As a matter of fact, on Tranquil.com today, we were even posting something uh, about how internal rotation, uh, hip internal rotation is, is often neglected from uh, from the perspective of going against hip external rotation. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's totally because uh, that hip, in, the, and you can catch in the FMS if you're paying attention on that bottom foot, right? That bottom foot's turning out, you can be able to catch the internal and external rotation. And see, can they hold and maintain that alignment? So, I mean, it's a it's a massive test for so many different things, more than just hip mobility. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, shoulder mobility test uh, screen in the FMS tells a lot. Again, there's so much that it tells us there's we need to be able to have some good external rotation of that shoulder on the downswing. Um, we also need to be able to dissociate upper body with that with that stable lower body. So uh, it, shoulder mobility is such an important one as well. Yeah, I mean, the ability to, to separate lower from uppers is, is, you know, that that creates so much lag in the golf swing. So being able to do that effectively and efficiently is huge. And and then, you know, what I like about doing the the FMS shoulder mobility screen is it really looks at, okay, at a high threshold standing position, right, can we lock that pelvis down and move up top? So it gives a little bit more insight to some other screens, but it, it, it allows to see how everything functions together in unison. So having that, that scap mobility and, and stabilization really makes a big difference into being able to smash it and send it. Absolutely. Um, you you liken the, the trunk stability push-up to the transmission in a car. Expand on that one. Yeah, you know, I think that's kind of like one of the things that a lot of people don't look at is, you know, for us to create max speed, we have to be able to trans translate, you know, when we're creating downward force, can we create that back out and, and create vertical thrust and can we create rotational power? So yeah, I look at the, the, it's like, okay, so we have this transmission, the core, I look at it as a transmission engine, right? Can we stretch? Can we, can we create the rotary slings and then can we stabilize them? So when we're going back to that takeaway and we're coming down and we're moving down, we're putting force in the ground and getting force out of the ground. If we don't have that great trunk stability, we don't have great pelvic control, and so from there we're going to have this energy leak, and we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be express maximum power, and that also gives us a pure thing of where we can easily pick up speed if we can get that transmission working or that trunk stability. Absolutely, great, great analogy, John. Actually, uh, sorry, Spence, can you um, expand on the vertical thrust? Because I I don't think a lot of people understand what vertical what you mean by vertical thrust so right so with, there's in the, in the component of the golf swing right or rotation of power we need to look at when we come down and we create force down into the club of the downswing right we have to push that back foot in the ground and then we almost got like pop out of it like you're coming out of a starting block right a great guy who looks at it, does it really really well is a rory or a justin thomas right you see him almost like explode like some elite golfers who hit it really far that are that are smaller that have to create a lot of acceleration you use the ground a lot you know we've seen at tpi that you know they'll have anywhere from four to six inch vertical leap when they swing the club so be able to create that downward force just like you would on a vertical jump is just as important and then we got to be able to take that vertical force and translate it into rotation to really drive the club effectively and efficiently so 
being able to, to hop, jump, skip, and, and be able to have that transmission, the trunk stability can be a game changer for a lot of golfers that, that don't think they can pick up any more speed because they're either, you know, they either feel like they max out or they feel like they're the aging athlete. And so having those two components can make a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, let's finish up. Obviously the last screen is, is rotary stability. And you talk about the ability to create this elastic energy between the upper and lower body. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I think about when we think about rotary stability, I think about can when we, we think I think about two lines in the body, right? We have our, the backswing line and we have the downswing line, right? It's when we pull that club back, can we create and wrap around that line? Can we wrap around that pole? Just think about like a tether ball. I think about like a tether ball. Like if, if we don't have a fixed pole when we hit the tether ball, that the ball is not going to really spin as hard and as fast as it could around the pole. But if we can lock and create that lateral line or that rotary stability, when we pull back and we create that downward force, bang, bang, it just goes, right? We don't have to work as hard and the golf swing just becomes way more explosive. So having that rotary stability on both sides, we can now stretch that rubber band and then snap it like a slingshot and propel the club down into the ground and explode the ball off the club. Yeah, see, uh, people don't realize how how much uh, really goes into uh, the golf swing. And, and, and again, why it's so important to understand that, uh, that we need to, to, there are specific things with golfers that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to. So good stuff. I, I saw a video that you did for TPI, but you also have it on the FMS mm -hmm. uh, website and you did some great work with, uh, with John actually doing, Using the club or, you know, you can use the dowel just to create tension in a lot of these mm -hmm. exercises. You did them with all of them, even uh, the, the like a single leg uh, RDL. Talk to us about mm -hmm. the using the club and creating that tension. Yeah, you know, you what I always look at is, you know, let's stop giving better coaching cues. Let's create a better learning environment. Right. If I can create a better learning environment and then I can create a better experience and then the athlete continues to evolve. So with John, what we found was and, and a lot of our clients is that a lot of our mobility issues or challenges that we were having was because we couldn't es establish a stable point to move on. So given the club gave us a little bit of a feed forward system. And, and as you saw in the videos, like John was using the ground for a lot of the exercises. Gave him, a, gave him the feedback of, okay, hey, my pelvis is in control or I'm not in control. And then it gave him the tension that he need in the opposing arm or leg or opposite of the body to really create that mobility and that lengthening process. And then we always link it to the breath because we find that, you know, and if you go back and look at history and time, that, that the breath is, is massively important before mobility, but then, but really for creating power and stability, right? If you look at big weightlifters and sprinters and, you know, everybody who creates a lot of force and a lot of power and go back to Bruce Lee, it, you know, it's all about the breath, right? So we get that breath go, we can do a lot of great things and, and the body just moves a lot better. So that tension and the breath just is huge for our program and what we're looking at. We're always coaching the breath and creating that tension. Yeah. I mean, that was, what, something that I learned through Strong First originally, uh -huh. uh, or really didn't just learn it, really put it into practice. And uh, it helped me tremendously lift a lot more uh, through like I PR'd, like when I took my, my certification on shoulder presses on, uh, and then, you know, later on different, uh, on, on deadlifting, on trap bar deadlifting. So just using that tension, even in, I, I know I first saw Stu McGill talk about being able to use that tension in a pull-up even. So it's not just on some of the warm-up exercises or, or just the heavy lifts, but there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. So you guys did a great job with that. And I'll remind everybody, I'll have links to that article that uh, that Spencer did. Um, it's, it's, he did a great job, so you can expand on that. So, Spence, you talk a lot about, we talked about the in-body. Um, you know, I know you got to be using some kind of 3D data for at least for your golfers. I'm not sure if you're using it for um, uh, other athletes, but talk to you about some of the technology uh, that you're using and, and really this sports science approach that you like to take. 
Yeah, I think we use technology to, to get a little more deeper insights. I think one of the challenges that's happening right now in this world is that we're using technology and we don't truly understand the principles or what the data means and what's good and what's bad and when it's off. So we first want to make sure we always own the principles and understand what are we truly assessing. So once we have those that understanding and that framework built, then we start looking, okay, what technology can give us a little better insight? So using KVS, and you know, we use KVS like a couple of times a year with the guys when they're playing well and when they're playing bad. So we can compare the data, um, you know, going over TPI at times and looking at getting on their 3D capture, which is dynamic and, you know, one of the best you can ever see. But then on a, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, using O-Ring and Whoop and those things to understand readiness has been a huge deal to help whether we're tweaking or changing programs, whether during a during a round or, I mean, during a, not a round, but during a tournament, you know, we've made adjustments on nutrition and sleep and, and hydration based on that. And then, you know, the other things we really like to use is using velocity-based training to truly understand, like, okay, are we at peak limit of a max? Or are we still got some room left in the tank or we've gone too far? Um, that could that could cause problems and, and having some great force plates to really understand how we're generating power. So using this combination of these different verticals of technology to give us deeper insights just allows us to accelerate the process and, and make better decisions overall. What are you using for velocity-based training? Uh, we use a couple of different things. Um, you know, we like the push band. Um, it has been given us some really good insights. Um, Jim Aware also, too, you know, if we're doing more standard barbell work, um, the great thing is like, I love using the combination of the two um, because the push band has a little bit more flexibility, especially like dumbbells or cable pulling. We'll do the TPI um, uh, power strength screens using the push band so we can really see, okay, are we really hitting that max or they got a little bit left in the tank or, you know, we're good there. Um, and then the, the gym aware gives a little bit better insights into fixed barbell work and, when we're training power, we want to take something simple and make it fast so that we can really train speed or power. We're not just getting we're training strength. So those have been great dynamic additions into our programs. Very cool. Now, actually, we were talking the other day about when you have a player on the road mm -hmm. and you, and this is why it's important to track things. You were talking about John having playing so much better when he's complying with some of the workouts that you're giving him on the road. Can you expand on that? Like, how do you do that? How do you figure that out? How do you um, kind of like, and, and what are you doing to make sure that they're, they're complying with that? Oh, I think first is make sure you have great communication, right? Making sure you're communicating with, with your athletes and giving them the why, the how and the what, I mean, that, that we all know that, that that's the, the golden circles, right? And, Looking at that, but then on the compliance side, you know, using, we use, you know, two different softwares. We use, um, one, we use Team Builder, which we love the delivery model of, of their system. Um, and so using Team Builder, we were able to see like how many exercises they completed, the loads, like it's just, it's a great UI. And then the backside of it, that all dumps into conductor analytics software that we're now able to analyze and see trend lines make it cool visualizations and then making that come to life because we just give somebody a report. Eh, it's kind of boring, but if we can make it show a cool graph and show like, Hey, like, look, when you're training 70% of the time, like you don't have to be perfect, but just be effective. You're training 70% of the time. You're finishing the top 10 or higher. How about we do that? Like, let's just focus on getting that done. And then we can continue to evolve. And as we grow, we can add more and more and more, but getting the, getting that number to come to life, getting those visualizations so that somebody can easily see that can just be a game changer in compliance and their performance and them truly understanding why they're doing it and what needs to be done for them to achieve their goals. Very cool. So you're saying when he was doing 70% of the workouts on the road, that is, he was finishing in the top 10. Yeah. And wow. yeah, I think the crazy status that, you know, we've seen is John's the second best of all time behind Tiger Woods and a hundred starts. He had 50 top tens. So, wow. um, it's pretty impressive to what he's done. And it's, it's a total compliment to him just owning his process, right? He's not trying to be somebody else. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes we challenges we see with younger athletes or younger pros, um, whether whatever sport they're in. Is that it takes three to four years, and John like really bought into it after a year, and he's seen great success. And hats off to him, and uh, we're just glad to be 
part of his team. Yeah, very cool. Let's just touch on something. I wasn't even planning on saying this, but talking about this, but you know, there there seems to be, and we talked about this on the strengthcoach.com forum recently, mm-hmm. is this idea about a team. Now, it, maybe with John, it's a little different because they the the, the player understands the importance. They have to have all these people in their in their world. How do you do this with the average golfer or even the the college golfer who where maybe the golf coach isn't on board all the time or you don't know like they they're in a different area the, the, the you don't know their physical therapist so maybe they're doing something they have different I think it's not that I'm saying it's overrated I don't think it's overrated but I think it's overplayed like not as many people really follow through with the team piece of it as kind of is advertised, for example. How do you how do you work through that with the team? You're the guy, you're in Scottsdale, you're not traveling. John's in Boston right now. You have some other players on the LPGA as well. Um, so how do you work with a team being, you know, stationary in, in Scottsdale? Well, I mean, one, I can't be more proud of my team. Uh, the THP team, I mean, we run a dynamic system where it's not about one coach and one individual. We all operate under the same framework and structure that we've built years to do. We have a three-level three level tier system to understand that. But um, that's one thing. Is it's not If it's all about me, then we will fail, right? There's no doubt. I mean, we'll only go so far. But, you know, I have a great team here that helps look from different eyes and different views. And then we have a, a great medical professional I work with, Dr. Jimmy Ewan. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know. Sure. Um, Dr. Ewan, you know, I right hand, I mean, Jimmy and I communicate all the time, immediately when a client, they come to their FMS, they go to the TPI, we have a zero or, or a one with some major issues that we can't fix. Boom, we're sending that text, we're sending their screen over, we're sending their TPI, we're sending all the data over to Jimmy so he can already be prepared for that conversation. Um, we also have a naturopath, a medical professional we work with here. So like in the end body, we see some major things come up like on their um, extracellular to total water, things are off with that high visceral fat or they want to go down deeper rabbit holes um, than our baseline screens and we can refer them out. And it becomes great for us because it also becomes this great referral network and always communicating with the team and being transparent with what you're doing just leads to success. And then they guess what? They're also thinking about what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve and how we can all work together and, and, the egos get put aside and I think it's just having those great relationships and that team and, and committing to it is the, is the toughest thing and, and, and sticking with the process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but it's worth it when you can, when, you know, when you see the results and how things change when you are working with people, uh, it's so much better. Um, Spencer, let's finish up with uh, this idea about training the COVID athlete. We've all gone through it. Everybody's, Really, like like I said, New York opens next week, or really by the time this comes out, we'll uh, we'll be in our first official legal opening. Anyway, uh, Boston's been open since or Mass has been open since June. Michigan's not open. California opened; they got shut down. Arizona's kind of all over the map, as you know. Um, we're also a lot of people have gotten into this idea about you know working digitally. You know, we we sponsor Train Heroic is on our our. Uh, podcast they have a great program as a great platform as well talk to us so the heart that like some of the the software stuff is is the easy part it's just delivering this in-person experience that you guys seem to have captured really well talk to us about some some how you feel like you've been able to achieve that you know it takes a lot of thought Anthony, i didn't say that much um you know to to go from in person to digital you have to be very strategic and very clear of what you're doing. You will spin your wheels and waste a lot of time. Trust me, I've been there. Um, I think you probably have too. It's a really tough thing. So when you're going from in-person digital, I think the first thing you got to look at is, is look at one, do you have a system, right? And is your system be able to be able to plug into other softwares? Because as we all know, softwares change. They they make decisions that may not be in your best interest or what you're trying to do. So having that system that can be delivered into multiple systems, I think is always the first start we always think about. And the second thing we look at is the framework is like, do we have the framework to build off of and grow that we're not continuing to do one offs, you know, where we're not doing the one thing for one client. And every time we have a new client, we have to reinvent the whole wheel. 
So having that framework, having that systematic approach. Then the second thing, you know, when you're when we looked at going digital, you know, the first thing we looked at all the different platforms out there, trust them out, tried them, went through them, and found you know softwares that fit our model and what we were trying to do. So and then we had to learn the tool. So then we had to learn the tool to deliver our system, and we look at it just like we looked at a kettlebell or a TRX or a barbell or a sandbag. It's like okay, this is the tool. How do we make the tool work for us? And then from there, you know, it, it becomes very strategic into, you know, what kind of content you're making? How is that being delivered? You know, you know, do we have the basics down? Then what's like a phase one, phase two, phase three rollout? And, you know, what, that's a constant evolution conversation. I mean, I just got out off a meeting with our head of program design. We were talking about the same concept. It's like, how do we deliver this in person? And even you know, our competition is, is not the guy down the road anymore or, or the other gym in the area we're competing globally and i mean i look at our competition is peloton global the new company carbon came out i mean that's our that's the new competitor and we have to be up for the challenge and be able to take it on and we've got to be and we got to be ready to go after it so yeah i think for me really diving into some other you know, some of this stuff with Trainer Oak. What I like personally about Trainer Oak was, and I'm, I'm sure other people have this too, other platforms, but I'm able to either, uh, you know, really communicate in app. And that's what I want. I don't want mm -hmm. this. I don't want to go through my phone. Um, I can send them videos. If, if it's a new video, if they ask me a question. Uh, also with their team part of it, you can, uh, there's like almost like a forum. So everybody on the team sees that. And when you start to get, and we have Luke Summers on, on the, on the podcast for the Trainer Rogue segment, talking about how they're doing it at, at John Wellborn's Power Athlete. And sometimes you got to do what I'm going to do. I will be signing up for like, like power athlete on train heroic is really, they're, they're like setting the standard. They're doing this great job. And I'm actually going to sign up for a month to like, see, be the customer of, of, and sometimes you got to do that. You got to, you got to be the customer to see through the customer's eyes. Like what's that experience you're getting? What do I like? What do I not like, et cetera, and try to replicate that. Some of the things that you like. So uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a different world, you know? Well, I think that's the fun thing about it is that you can learn from so many people now, right? Yeah. You can go back and look at ideas. I mean, before, I mean, we had to go to the Perform Better Summit. I mean, that was yeah. that was like the, the, the truth. And now, I mean, we got it online. Um, we have, you can go see the other, what other people are doing, what they're doing. I think the biggest thing is, is not getting overwhelmed and, and being true to your mission, knowing your vision and, you know, really thinking about how does this work for you and what you're trying to accomplish and, and not getting caught up in everything else. Absolutely. Well, great stuff, Spence. I really appreciate you coming on. Congrats on all your success with your business and and everything that you're doing. You're doing some great stuff, and a lot of a lot of people can learn from uh, from what you guys are doing. You're staying ahead of the curve. So, thanks for taking the time out and coming on the show. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. And looking forward to listening to more Strength Coach shows. I can't wait. All right, that's going to do it for episode 294 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days just to buck. You'll have all the access to all the videos, articles, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Don't forget, the free summer seminar series is still going on. 67 total top professionals in the industry. I just did mine last week. It was really good. And um, it's going on until mid-September. There's live presentations with Q&A sessions all via Zoom. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Spencer Tatum for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement. Thanks to Luke Summers and Train Heroic. Don't forget, Coach Boyle and I use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training Head over to trainerroak.com to start your free 14-day trial. Great Cook and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name is Anthony Renna. All my stuff is at continuefit.com. Thanks again for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.